and welcome to the Splendid Science of MMA Podcast. This is John Franklin from the Cage Side Press Podcast Network. I am joined by Jamie Varner, former WC lightweight champion. Jamie, before we get started, let's talk about the recipe. I mean, I did the research, so we might as well talk about it. Oh, okay. You have been um, fight of the night three times, upset of the year Edson Barbosa once, fight of the year against Joe Lozon, former WC lightweight champion. You uh, successfully defended it. You won it from Rob McCulley. You successfully defended it twice. Uh, fight of the night a couple of times in WC. So, you know, you and I are going to have a conversation a little bit. I want to talk about the uh, UFC Phoenix uh, through your career, through the scope of your career. Okay. So the reason why I live with the resume is just because you're, you're overqualified to have this conversation. Right? Okay. You're, I mean, you've been around for a long time, and you've seen a lot. you fought a lot of different guys, and you've held, you held belts and all that. Let's start at the top with Barbarina versus Luke fight. You, of all people, know a fight of the night. Swing for the fences, kill or be killed type of fight. You had a war with Abel Trujillo, a fight you were in complete control of until the very end. And this is just one of many fights you were in where you, were complete, where you just completely let it rip. Talk a little bit about what it's like to be in that kind of fight and how the urge to keep coming forward while you're smelling blood sort of dominates all other instincts. I mean, you dominated that guy. But yet you still, like, you found yourself in a firefight, right? And then when that kicks in... Does that just take over everything? Well, um, before I walked out into that fight, uh, Joe, Joe Silva came into my locker room and told me, these fights have been terrible. There's been no knockouts, there's been no submissions, and we need somebody to save this card. That's, he looked me dead in the face and looked right at me. And the game plan was to take him down right. and to smash his face in and to choke him, whatever. I, I had a three-week training camp. I was not in good shape. So a firefight was not what I wanted. You know, if I could catch him with a shot, that was, that'd be great. But if I could take him down, I could control him on the ground and submit him, which my jiu-jitsu game, I won worlds as a, as a blue belt. I won worlds as a, as a purple belt. I, have a, I had a pretty decent jiu-jitsu game, trained with Gustavo Dantes. And um, I felt really confident in my ability to be able to take him down and uh, control him on the ground. But Joe Silva told me that, and um, I, I, I decided, I flipped the script. I decided to put on, put on a show. The first round, I was able to take him down. And I, and I controlled him a little bit there. And then the second round, I'm like, that's it. I'm just going for it. And I, I hit him with, and I could tell he was tired. I hit him with a couple shots. And I saw his eyes roll back into his head. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm just going for it. And it, it, at that point, it's just animal instincts take over. Yeah. It's not really training or thinking. But I went into that round and I went to that fight knowing that I was going to deviate from the game plan a little bit to put on a show and try and save this card. I knew I was a better striker. And I had never been knocked out. So I, 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 went, I walked into that with blind confidence. And um, got tired, hands got down. He was tired and dazed, and that's when they're dangerous, man. They're dangerous when they're dazed, and they're just trying to, they're just trying to survive, right? They're in survival mode. And I remember taking my eyes off him just for a second, looking at Herb Dean, just like waiting for him to step in. And then next thing I know, I'm picking myself up off the mat. So it's uh, that was that was a crazy, crazy fight, crazy turn of events. But I lost, I made more money that night losing than I ever made right. any other night in my career. Right, but that's what I, and you know, through the research, now I, I remember you, I mean, I'm old enough to remember you when you were an active fighter and watching you fight. So my memory of you as a fighter was always, Jamie Varner brings a lot of skills to the, to the uh, cage. He's a, a talented guy. What I found in the research and looking back, I did not realize, number one, how much you took the fight to everybody. You're always coming forward. And just how m many of your fights, even that you ultimately ended up losing, that you were winning. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a second. But, and I don't mean that as kind of like a weird backhanded compliment. I mean it to say like this, is, like you were at the highest level. And to, Dude, you're not saying anything I haven't thought about. Right. But no, and I don't mean to say that yeah, like, no, it's yeah. Fine. It's okay. Fine. I want to talk about Cain Velasquez and Francis Ngannou through a couple of different scopes. First, let's talk about Cain. He's a former champion looking to get back to championship level. Yeah. We talked about it a second ago. You won the lightweight belt from, uh, with a TKO over Razor Rob McCullough. You finished Marcus Hicks, and then you won a split decision over Donald Cerrone. And then came the unification fight with Ben Henderson, which you lost, but it was 100% a fight you were winning. You just got caught. So the next fight is Kamal, Kamal Shahrus. Now, when you're, when you're thinking about the next fight, because I, I, the booking for Kane was interesting for me yeah. in that they put him right at the very top, almost like, hey, we want you to beat this kid and be, when DC retires, you're back to who you were. Yeah. When you lose the belt to Henderson, is your thought process, I need to fight someone to help me grow as a fighter, or I need to get on the fastest path back to the lightweight belt? I didn't have a choice. 
Okay. I didn't have a choice. Um, I didn't want to fight Kamal Shalroos. Um, I didn't want to fight in Edmonton. It was, uh, I cut a lot of weight back then. And mm-hmm. now, I mean, I did throughout my whole career, I cut a lot of weight. I walked around 185 pounds, about 8% body fat, maybe 7% body fat. I trained year round. Right. So when I, even when I wasn't like training for fights, I was swimming at ASU. I, I was competing in other things. I was doing jujitsu competitions. Uh, Spartan races, different things like that. So I was always in pretty good shape, um, but it was it was a fight that, that I had to take, and that they made me take. And um, I don't want to get into all the politics and you know what I think is corruption back then, but uh, I won that fight, and uh, they called it a draw because they wanted to set me back up with Donald Cerrone. Right. That's why. That's why I did not get the win. Like, why the hell would they bring Cecil Peoples all the way up to Edmonton? Canada, why? Like, why bring right. him up all the way up there when he has historically been a terrible judge? Yeah. Historically, they do it because they have him in his pocket. Yeah. They have Cecil Peoples in their pocket, and they can do whatever they want. And um, I didn't want that fight, but you know, I, I trained hard for him. I beat him, and then I went and fought Donald Cerrone in his hometown. Elevation, every advantage. After I broke my hand in the Kamal fight quick turnaround like I didn't get time to breathe right. and I, I, I wanted to take like six months off I want to take some time off and they told me if I didn't take that fight that they, that they would sit me out for a year so it's like my hands are tied yeah. like I had to fight and I had already sat out a year and then I lost my fight to uh, to Benson Henderson and back then I was making like 17,000 shows, 17,000 win as a champion. Right. There was no negotiating with that company, dude. Yeah. There was no negotiating with them. They were bullies. And um, it was it was tough. It was tough. But uh, you know what? Ultimately, um, I'm, I've made a pretty successful life for myself outside of fighting. Mm-hmm. And I think that the things with the Kamal Shalroos fight and then the fights early on in the WEC honestly kind of forged me to be the man I am today. Yeah. And... Um, I feel like I'm hard as nails now. How would you have, if you had your way, what would you have done? Who would you have fought or who, like what kind of a fight? Would you want someone, do you think that having defended the belt a couple times you deserved an immediate rematch or do you think you wanted to, like what was the next step? I, I would have liked to have had a rematch. I thought I felt like I deserved it. Um, Benson Henderson was running for me the whole time. I mean, the, the fight was like a breakdance fight. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't want to engage. He didn't want to fight and um, I got overzealous because the whole wrestling mentality, stalling, right? Like right. that's a lot of us wrestlers, with the exception of Benson Henderson, who likes to, who at that time ran away. He turned out to be a great fighter and he became a dear friend of mine. But at that time, all he did was run from me. Right. And I was trying to press the action, engage. If I wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been a fight. It would have been the most boring five round fight that I would have won, you know, 50 to 49, whatever, 50 to 46. And um, that's just not my style, man. It's not yeah. the way I roll. I'd rather go out on my go out on my sword, you know, than die on my knees, you know. Right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Nganu, a fighter that many pundits felt lost his way after the Miocic fight. He had a Derek Lewis debacle, and doubt is starting to creep in as to who he is and if he can compete at the highest level. Let's go back to your career. The commentator said before the Trujillo fight that 2010 was the worst year of your career. You lost the belt to Henderson, and it's a draw to Shao Roos, like we talked about. Lost to Cerrone, lost to Shane Roller in Glendale. So first, was that a true assessment of your 2010? You kind of touched on 2010 from your own perspective. When you look at Nganu, did you ever lose your way mentally? Meaning 100%. like, okay, talk to me about it. Yeah, 100%. De- dealing the business side of competition of the WEC and the USC, that took the win from my sales. I am a pure competitor, and the, they undercompensated me, they treated me like shit, and that bugged me, because I'm such an emotional person, right. and I was young and emotional. Now, there's, it's one thing to be an emotional person, but now I'm 34 years old, I know I can control them, and I can kind of see through all the bullshit, but back then, I was young, I didn't know how to deal with it, and I, I resented them, and I resented, I resented the company, and I didn't... I fought and did stuff because I felt like it was what I was supposed to do and what people wanted me to do, but I didn't want to fight. Like, they had burnt me out, man. They, they had taken all the fun and the life from fighting, the fun out of competition, and they treated me like shit, dude. Yeah. Like, no, no employee wants to go to bat and die for his employer. And the Donald Cerrone fight, 
that was probably 50% of me. The Shane Roller fight, I didn't even care. I didn't care about those fights, man. Yeah. It just, they treated me like such shit, I wanted out. So, let's talk about a little bit about the WC, just kind of springboarding from that. And correct me if I'm wrong. The vibe that I got when you were a fighter, and I think the vibe that a lot of people got, especially in the WC, it may have changed because I think that you were on this career resurgence in the UFC a little bit, yeah. like people were kind of rooting for you. Uh, but in WC, tell me if this is an incorrect assessment. The vibe that was put off is like, here's a rich prick. Like, here's a kid that kind of has like a chip on his shoulder. Was that part of how the way the WC was treating you? Is that assessment way off? Way off. Do you man. never got that? You never saw that vibe that people thought, like, so let's not say rich prick. Better that people thought that you a little bit were the heel. Maybe it's because of who Cerrone was and you guys were kind of on opposite ends. Do you see what I'm saying? And some people were no. like, Jamie should just embrace this, or I what's your assessment of that? I wasn't the heel until the Donald Cerrone fight. Right. And then the fucking WEC marketing machine wanted him to be the. Pumped him up and put me down, kept me kept me hidden. They didn't promote me. They didn't tell a story. When 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 Uriah Faber broke his hand in the second Mike Brown fight, they cut his glove off. They showed the they showed the crowd his hand was broken. I broke my hand the very first fucking round of that Don Cerrone fight. The very first round. This right here, this that scar on my hand, yeah, that was Don Cerrone. Very first round. I fought four more rounds with a broken hand. Fourth round, I broke my left foot, kicking him in the face. Like, they didn't. They didn't cut off my glove. Right. They didn't show the. They didn't show the world that. They didn't talk about that. They didn't promote that. They. They just picked their favorites, man. And because, one, I was emotional, and I spoke out against them. I yeah. called it like it was. And because I did that, they're like. Fuck you. You got put on the other side of the... Yep. Yeah, and with then Cerrone. On the other sense. side of the marketing, and they pumped him up, made him to be this, you know, God's gift to the world while making me the heel. All right, so let's move on to the independent circuit. You talked about it uh, a little bit earlier with yes. XFOs and XFCs and Titan. Five promotions all in their own right. You beat Tyler Combs, drop a fight to Dakota Cochran, uh, wins over Nate Jolly and Drew Fickett. So at this point... Where's your head at? I mean, after all this happened, you get a call on short notice for Edson Barbosa, a guy who just put Terry Edom on the highlight reel for eternity. Explain to me the, the mental game plan, and I guess we talked about it a little bit earlier, but do you see any similarities between, and we're talking a little bit about the UFC Phoenix card that happened not too long ago, between like maybe a Luke Sanders fighting Hen and Burrell and yourself? Like when you walk into that cage and you're Luke Sanders, are you like, this is the guy who, you know, 135 pounds, was taking out everybody and they thought he was pound for pound best in the world. When you fought Barbosa, and again, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but do you, did you see that with Luke Sanders when he was going to the cage or were you just kind of like, yeah, Burrell's finished? You know what I'm saying? Burrell's a different fighter than he used to be. You, you can only have, you have this like limited time and you can only go through so many wars and then your body's just, your, 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 your brain can't handle it anymore. Right. You can only take so many shots for so long before enough is enough, your, your body's had enough. And, um, you know, just to kind of reflect back on that, on the XFC and Titan XFO and all that stuff. The Titan fight, I got food poisoning. They they kept us in a kept us in a hotel, fed fed us crap food. I got food poisoning, and I was still forced to fight this guy. I mean, I was literally crapping my pants in the bathroom, right when they were calling my name out to go walk to the cage. Super sick. They it was the worst promotion I'd ever been a part of. I will never I will never support them. Or anything they do but um, you know Luke Sanders and just kind of just to go back to Luke I mean he trains hard he's young he's hungry and Hen and Brow's been in a lot of wars yeah some people just need to know when to say when and um, when I knocked when I hit my head in the Drew Dober fight in the uh, in the very last Phoenix card like that's that's something that would have normally knocked me out but I knew that I was done it was time. I, I couldn't stay healthy that whole year. I broke my ankle with the Krause fight, and I really wanted to fight him again. And um, I just, I just, I pulled a calf muscle. I, it's, I got a concussion with uh, in the Abel Trujillo fight. I just, I couldn't stay healthy, man. And I knew it was time. And I even knew going into that fight, it was probably going to be my last one. And I'd hope that I could go out and win in my hometown. But when I saw the video replay, and I went to throw him, I hit my head, knocked myself out, woke up in a rear naked choke. It's like. Yeah, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. 
And, and you transitioned perfectly. Let's go back to Kane for a second. He's at a point where it seems like we're getting towards, towards the end. He needs uh, to stop. Naga Nganu uh, may have been a little bit too steep of a hill for him to climb. First fight back. You just said your last fight was here in Phoenix. First round submission, lost to Drew Dober, and you retired in the cage. That's not a decision you really come to, I don't think, in the moment. You had. To, I would imagine it was on the table going in at least, right? Oh, I knew. I, I told my mom this was going to be my last one. So, uh, yeah, I knew I was going to be done. I, like I said, I hoped that I was going to go out with a win. Um, I had earned a lot of respect back from the from the UFC by doing all the favors for them. Yeah. Taking the Joe Lowe's on fight on three weeks notice, taking the Abel Trujillo fight on three weeks notice, um, taking the Edson Barbosa fight on short notice, and I, I turned into a company man. And I and I attribute that to my my agent Oren Hodak, KO Reps. He um he he taught me how to really play it. Yeah. And um, that's where I, I went from this the heel to like the underdog story that everybody wanted to cheer for. Yeah. And everybody liked watching me fight because they knew I was gonna bring it every time. And uh, I liked that. You know, I didn't always win and I could have eked out I could have trained like the like the Jackson guys, like like George St. Pierre. I was an all American in wrestling. I could double leg people and take them down and hold them down and I could have grinded out fights, but man, something about putting on a show and yeah. having people love you. Whether you win or lose or you put on a show they hugged you after and they love you, and um, yeah, I think that uh, the career, I, I had made up my mind going into it, but with, as far as like Kane goes, he's just, he's not the same. After t a two year layoff, he's been riddled with injuries. You can only go hard for so long, and this is a guy that w was a state champion in high school wrestling, wrestled his ass off, then you know, went to, he went to Iowa Central Community College for a year, wrestled his ass off, then went Division One, wrestled his ass off, then started fighting, fought some of the toughest guys. Um, I mean, this he's just had a lot of wars. You can't have that many battles. And eventually your time runs out. Yeah. And I think his time's run out, man. I think it's time for Kane to move on to something else. He's made a ton of money. He's the pride of Mexico. I mean, he can make money doing other things. Um, but I just don't think he can take it anymore. Because that shot that hit him, they're trying to blame it on the illegal this and you no, know, his a knee, his his knee popped. No, he was out. He got hit with a, a short uppercut, and that was it. He just can't take a shot no more. And that's the question: is 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 I think the way they're going to move that forward is the power of Nganu. But if Kane's a little punchy now and he's a little chinny, and that is, it, of course, they're going to say, "Look at Francis Ngannou he knocked out former world champion with a short uppercut." Yeah. That could be, like you said, a a, a bigger byproduct of where Kane's at. Yeah, and, and his. So let me ask you this though: you talk, you touched on the wrestling. Do you think wrestling? And I just we'll hit this briefly, but do you think wrestling adds length to a fighter's career, or shortens it in this respect? To be a wrestler at the highest level, you put yourself through hell. That does one of two things: one, it wears you out yeah. physically, but two, it prepares you in a way mentally that others. So you are able to do things that maybe a guy that started Taekwondo can't. Just from a pushing your body standpoint, yeah, you know mindset. more about cutting weight and all that. What do you think? How do you think it affects being a? I think it, it adds longevity to your career if you stick to the game plan, if you stick to the script, if you stay a wrestler. Randy Couture, yeah, Chael Sonnen, right? These are guys that are wrestlers. They were high level wrestlers. They were good wrestlers. Uh, Matt Hughes was able to prolong his career. Um, George Saint Pierre, who turned into pretty much just a wrestler, yeah. his last like five years. And after the Matt Sarah fight. George St. Pierre was never yeah. the same. He's like, it's not happening again. No. He's so, like this. Um, yeah, I think that uh, wrestling can add years onto your career. But for me, I never got the respect I deserved. I never made the money I should have made. So I had to knock people out yeah. in order to get respect and get paid. Yeah, especially like you said. I mean, you ended up probably getting, I don't want to say near what you should have made. But, I mean, the bonuses no are probably. Close. No, but I mean, the bonuses probably got you closer because you were willing to put on those fights. Yeah, I mean, well, let's look at it like this. Um, when, I fought, when I fought Edson Barbosa, um, I won, he lost, he still made more than me. Yeah. I fought um, I fought Joe Lozon, he, even if he would have lost, he still would have made three times more than me. Um, when, I, when I beat Melvin Gillard, I won and he still made twice as much as me. It was just, it was just crazy. And then when I went to go renegotiate my contract after that, they're like, no, we're gonna bump you up two more thousand dollars, but that's it. Like, well, I beat this guy. Should I at least make what he made? Yeah. And then I was beating the shit out of this guy on three weeks notice, and I asked for that fight again. Like, with the training camp, Joe Lozon's dead. Yeah. He is not as good as me. And I, he, uh, I, I don't know if he would admit it or not, but he is not as good as me. I was better than him in every aspect. I just got tired. Three weeks, 
through training camp, had to go from 185. I was on a bar stool when I took that fight. Had to leave the bar, start training. Yeah. 185 pounds down to 155 in three weeks. Not healthy. So, um, yeah, I, I think that wrestling can add years onto your career for sure. So I want to talk about fighting in your home state because uh, you had a lot of high-profile losses, but your record overall in your home state is 8-3-1, and one, eight wins, six submissions, one TKO, one decision. Um, so is there, is there more added to it? Is it different fighting here? Do you have different responsibilities? Do you enjoy it? I mean, obviously early in your career it was different because you were supporting local shows and yeah. you were kind of a local star. And then with UFC, it's kind of like, okay, everybody's coming into my town. Yeah. Do you like it? Do you not yeah, like it? I, I did like it because um, I was able to sleep in my own bed. Um, cutting weight for me, I, I, it was a little bit easier. But they, I'm not gonna lie, Vegas turned to a second home. Yeah. So um, if I if I could have chose a fight in Phoenix or fight in Vegas, I probably would have chose Vegas, just because I had a really good routine there. Um, I, I had the gyms to go to. I knew where I was gonna cut weight, how I was gonna cut it. Um, and but I had the same setup here. Uh, I liked fighting here because I didn't have like none of my friends and family had to travel, and a lot more of my fans could be there. Right. So that was that was really nice and. You know, without me lobbying to the House and the Senate to pass the MMA laws, to get the New Jersey State Athletic Laws passed and sanctioned here, without me, like, the UFC would have never been here. Right. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, that was like a badge of honor and pride for me to be able to fight in the UFC and WEC in my state because had it not been for me, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been able to come here. All right, finally one question. I've always wondered this, and... Um, I just want to get your thoughts on this. So Chael Sonnen once said that he had to see a sports psychologist because he felt that sometimes he had given away fights because he didn't think he deserved to win. He was looking for a way out. And when it was presented to him, he would take it. So he was kind of what we might call a quick tap, right? God, that was so honest, though. I've watched your fights. And in some of them, you, you tend to be a fairly quick tap for being such a mentally strong guy. Is that a byproduct of, like, training where, like, you know when you're had... Your head and you just tap, or what? What is that? And yeah. and, and am I properly assessing no, it? No, you're you're 100 right. And and then there's, but there there is a unique dichotomy between the two, though. Um, I think that there are times that I tapped super quickly, and it was 100 percent because I hated the company, and I didn't care, because I had lost my fire. They they'd stolen it from me. So, but when you're caught, you're caught. Yeah. Benson Henderson, I knew he had a good that was a, guillotine. Yeah. I knew he had a good guillotine. I specifically trained to put my, my head on the opposite side to go to his weak hand and purposely trained that. And then when I got into the fight, I did the opposite. And I don't know that if that was some sort of subconscious thing. Um, I have no idea. Or because I was just trying to put the action and make something happen with this guy because he's running like a little girl. Right. But... Um, yeah, I don't know, but I do think that that was a very honest statement, and there are definitely there were definitely times that I think I could have held on a little bit longer, and I didn't, and I I 100% attribute that to the lack of fire that I had in my belly, due to the way I was treated by the company. All right, um, we talked about the mental game. We've talked a lot about the psychology. Um, what, what's your relationship with the fans now? How do they remember you? How do you when you interact with them? Do you get guys that were more remember you from WEC, from UFC. What's your relationship now with, with MMA fans? You know what? I very rarely do I get haters that talk shit to me. Um, there are some like cowboy nut huggers that still will say, "Oh, that phantom knee." Yeah, it was a phantom knee, and I quit the fight. The doctor stopped the fucking fight. Right. He knee me in the face. He was a professional kickboxer, and I was on the ground. Like, why would he even? Yeah. He knows better. He knows better. He got his ass kicked for four rounds, and I only had one fucking hand. He got his ass kicked for four rounds. So, um, so every once in a while, I'll get that. But no, man, I get like really great responses from fans. Man, they they say a lot of beautiful things to me. Man, they always ask me, "When are you gonna come back out of retirement? Are you gonna come out of retirement? We miss you. We miss your style." Like, I get a really good reception from the fans, and there's not very many of them anymore. I only got like ten thousand followers on Instagram, and uh, my. I, I looked at my Twitter today. I had 0.1% growth in my Twitter. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really, I'm not getting the fans that come at me anymore. But I still, every once in a while, um, I get some positive stuff on on Twitter. But it's mostly hate on Twitter from, the, like I said, the Cowboy fans and just the trolls. But on Instagram and Facebook, 
I get so many great fans that just say great things to me. It's There's cool. different vibes on Instagram yeah. than there is on Twitter. Twitter's yeah. a home. Guys go there just to look for Jamie. Yeah. Guys to, you know, take shots at. Um, yeah. Let's talk about what you're doing now. Um, you obviously, I mean, I'm obviously aware of you because you live in the Valley, and uh, I watched your fights very closely when you were, when you were in your prime. But uh, you kind of got back in the news with the whole Chael thing. Yeah. Right? Um, talk a little bit about that. Talk about what you're doing now. Catch people up on where you've been and what you're doing. So I retired. Um, that My last fight was in December of 2014, but I, I officially retired and signed my papers January 15th, 2015 from the UFC. Um, I had owned a gym and I was I owned a, opened a gym in 2013. I was trying to balance running a business and running my fight career. And I think that was ultimately my downfall towards the end. But... Um, when I retired from fighting, I ran the gym for about another like 16 months. Um, I ended up getting acquired. My, my business partner actually bought me out and then he, they, he took that business and sold it to somebody else. So I, I left the business with a little money in my pocket and I went back to college and finished my degree. Um, I dropped out of Lockhaven University right before my senior year because of the opportunity to fight Hermes Frank on the UFC. So dropped out, went back, finished it. And uh, at Grand Canyon University, got got my business uh, business degree in marketing, my minor in finance, and I started doing medical sales. And I was a 1099, 1099 independent contractor, just leveraging relationships with physicians that I met, broke, broke my foot, and some fight fans. There were a lot of physician fight fans out here, um, especially orth, orthopedic surgeons. So um, I got I got a great opportunity doing some sales for them, and then I catapulted that into another opportunity doing lab sales and working with primary care physicians and just handling all their lab services. And after that, I was finally able to get in with the big boys. Got hired by Boston Scientific. They moved me out to Atlanta. Uh, I worked at Boston Scientific for about a year out there. Didn't really like Atlanta, but um, I found an opportunity that could bring me back home with BioAccelerator, which is the company I'm working for now. And they're a stem cell and regenerative medicine company, which for me, a lot of the reasons why I retired, and I, I've had tons of concussions. Cause, and it wasn't mostly in the fights, it was mostly in training. I mean, I didn't, I didn't get knocked out very often, but I mean, I would go home dizzy, puking, having a hard time seeing, like, and those are all little concussions. They're all concussions. You don't have to get knocked out to have a concussion. I had, and I didn't know that. So the, the doctor estimated that I had about 30 based off the white matter in my brain. And um, so with stem cells, there's been a positive cognitive benefit and a correlation between stem cell therapy and brain like regeneration. Like it can help regenerate blood flow, um, restore blood cell or brain cells, like all sorts of stuff. It's crazy what it can do. And so I was really intrigued selfishly because of that. Right. And um, I took a massive pay cut to come, come back to Arizona and work for this company. But for me, I'm gonna go out at the end of March I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna get 100 million stem cells directly into my, my spine, so inner fecal, and I'm gonna do another 50 million into an IV, just kind of help with all the other stuff going on. And I've seen people with Parkinson's go into our clinic in Columbia, shaking like a leaf, and get stem cells, and within like three or four minutes, the tremors stop. Now, the guy I'm talking about, he his tremors came back, but they weren't nowhere near as violent. So he came in just like this, and then, like, it was like this. And then two days later, the guy was in our waiting room reading the newspaper, tremors gone. And I'm like, when I saw that, I'm like, this is what I wanna do. Right. I wanna be a part of this. So I reached out to Chael and they hired me on to be their national marketing director. Essentially, they just wanted me to leverage my contacts with the UFC and fighters and athletes and get them down there. But they gave me a pretty cool title. So uh, I called Chael, he was interested, and he kind of owed me one. And uh, so he went down there and he did it and he noticed benefits right away. I, after his second treatment, he didn't need his readers anymore. This is a guy that you know had to have readers on to read, do his text messages. And he was texting without his readers and didn't even realize it. And then when he realized it, he's like, oh my gosh. And he's texting like one of his producers or business partners or something. Hey, I'm sending you this message and I'm not wearing my readers right now. So um, I was able to help him out, and and in return he's he's given us he's given you know shout outs multiple shout outs, and he actually just interviewed me yesterday, 
So I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna oh. be on I'm gonna be on Chell's podcast talking about uh, stem cell therapy and That's awesome. different stuff. So yeah. Well, and, and I mean, he's got a very successful podcast. He has a very huge following on YouTube. Yeah. And when he did that post on YouTube, dedicated specifically to that, yeah. I was like, Chael's not the kind of guy that's gonna waste time. You know, I mean, he's for whatever he does to promote fights. Yeah. He's a pretty straight shooter, smart guy. Yeah. So he's not flying down to Columbia just to you know get a suntan. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like he's, that's when I knew that. Like when he dedicated time to the entire post, like a YouTube video yeah. on it. I was like, this is that's what kind of raised my antennas up a little bit, and I was like, all right. And then from that, I kind of was like, well, I wonder what Jamie's up to, and and, and kind of as far as fights go. Um, okay. Let's get out of here on this. So I have to pay you a compliment because we've talked about the ups and downs of your career. Oh, okay. So here's the compliment. Um, I wore my Toro Gotti hoodie tonight. It wasn't an accident I wore it on purpose. I wore it because Toro Gotti was an action fighter and you're an action fighter. And it's my belief, based on all the things I've read and all the research I've done on Toro Gotti, that you were his kind of fighter and he would have enjoyed watching you fight. I've enjoyed watching you fight. Thank you for the great fights. Continued success to you and your family. Um, I'll get you out of here on this last question. Your great, great grandson, a person you'll probably never meet, if he finds out Jamie Varner was in his family lineage, what's the fight that you would want him to watch that says this is who Jamie Varner was as a fighter? Razor Rob McCullough. Reason being it was Razor Rob McCullough because I grew up watching that guy. I, I, re I had all the old King of the Cage and Gladiator Challenge VHS tapes which my great-great-grandchild won't ever know yeah. what any of those are. And he's the guy that sold those tapes. I mean, he was on every main, I mean, he was a main event yeah. guy for them. Yeah, go ahead. So I remember watching him, and he was the badass kickboxer with Team Punishment, and Tito, and Tiki, and all those guys down there. And um, the game plan was, it was typical, mm -hmm. like, striker versus grappler. You know, you don't want to fight a, fight a shark in the water. You want to pull that motherfucker up onto the beach, right? Yeah. And fight him there. Well, I tried that first round. I tried taking him down in Albuquerque, New Mexico is like 5,500 feet above sea level, where Arizona is like 800 to like 1,200, right? We're not very high up. And uh, so I tried taking him down a bunch. I couldn't hold him down. I almost gassed myself out in the first round. And after that first round, my trainer, Trevor, went forehead to forehead with me. And I'm like, dude, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. Like, I can't hold him down. He's like, James, just relax. It was a beautiful moment. Just just relax. We're gonna have to box him. You're just gonna have to box him. You're gonna have to trust in your striking. Because I, I was a national champion boxing in college. I'd grown up boxing. I'd done boxing, but I was scared. I was scared to let my hands go with those little gloves. It's different, and I didn't want to get highlight reel knocked out, but I mean, I was probably gonna get knocked out anyways if I would have if I would have kept trying to wrestle him. Sure. So I just, I went into that fight and it like felt like a video game. I went to that second round and I was able to catch my breath a little bit. I was able to control the pace and I didn't shoot any more takedowns. I just started boxing and I started, it was working and all my training just took over and I just flipped that switch and that was me overcoming a lot of demons, man. And that was, that was, I grew as a fighter that night and I'm friends with Rob McCullough and I thank him because without him, I don't know if I would have ever been Jamie Varner, the world champion. Jamie Varner, the guy that beat Edson Barbosa. Jamie Varner, that just you could always count on having a good fight. I think I would have, I would have tried fizzled out, probably like all the other guys. You know, just undercard guy that they would have never known or recognized because just another wrestler. So he changed my life, and that's the fight I want my great great grandchild to watch. Well, that's exactly who you are. You're all that and more. Please tell everybody where you can be found on social media and how they can get in touch with all the information about um, BioAccelerator. Yeah, I, um, I'm, you can reach out to me on at Jamie Varner on Twitter, at Jamie Varner on uh, Instagram, just Jamie Varner on Facebook. I have a fan page, chill, Jamie Varner. I respond. Like, if you comment on my stuff, you slide into my DMs, whatever, I respond. I, if I have 100 messages, I'll respond to all of you. It'll take a long time, but I do it. Um, I, I make... I make myself available for the fans, and I love talking about MMA. So, yeah, you guys can reach out to me there. And then uh, I'm Jamie at BioAccelerator.com. If you want to send me an email if you guys are interested in BioAccelerator, or just go to BioAccelerator.com. Uh, we, we change lives. All right, there you have it, guys. This has been the Splendid Science of MMA podcast, joined by Jamie Varner. Make sure you listen to all the podcasts on the Cage Side Press podcast network. We might be uh, talking to Jamie about some other things in the future. And uh, tell your friends, subscribe. 
You can follow us on social media as well. Peace. All right, Jamie, I appreciate it. Can you...